in with Max and Brent, unlocking the minds of the industry's top real estate professionals. And now, here are your hosts, Max Rabin and Brent Jackson. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Keaton Podcast. I'm Max Rabin. And I'm Brent Jackson. Brent, we have our ultra super guest host on today, Lauren Davis from TTR Sotheby's in Bethesda, Maryland. What's up? Thanks for having me back. I appreciate it. And um, today is special because both of you are here. I'm usually a sub for one of you. That's right. So this, thank you for jointly having me. And you also have one of the best podcast voices. Like, it's incredible. So we love that too. Yeah, you two together are great. It's like magic. Thank you. Butter. Um, And our guest today is Michael DeSantis. Michael DeSantis is a real estate coach. He's a business coach. Um, He's going to rip us all a new one today. (laughs) and uh, tell us what we're doing wrong. And um, to our listeners, you're gonna get some really good advice today. There's no doubt about that. Um, Michael, actually, uh, you started off in in the legal world and then you got into coaching. Why don't you tell us a little about your background? So I'm a reformed lawyer, right? which was the best kind. But I spent like a long time sort of in a corporate career uh, working both in law firms and then I went in house and basically spent all the time just advising all kinds of corporate executives problems, you know, difficulty getting along with others, <laughs> managing up, managing their team. And so when I left the corporate world, uh, my husband and I had twins uh, 17 years ago. I decided, you know, I needed to find a way to still do something relevant and exciting for me, uh, but sort of on my terms. And uh, early in that sort of decision-making process, I came across a bunch of uh, real estate agents who needed some help. And that began a, a journey that has been 15 years now of, uh, you know, helping and cajoling and uh, getting people to where they don't think they need to go, but they definitely need to be. And so it's been a really great journey. I've really, uh, you know, quite enjoyed it. Now, I know I'm a very like, uh, like one dimensional type of audience because I am a realtor and this is all I've ever done in my life. But is there something special about realtors that we just need a lot of coaching? Because I know that this has become a lot more popular lately. Um, we're out there on our own. Sure. We're trying to put businesses uh, and, and clients together and everything on our own. Tell us a little bit about like why realtors need this kind of help. So my experience is most realtors do not treat their business like a business. And what they end up doing is, is they really just adapt a you know, pretty strong sales approach but unless you sort of put that accountability and the business framework around it, you leave out a whole lot of money on the table. And so, you know, that's the rule, not the exception. And what I try and do is go through sometimes that painful process of getting uh, agents and teams to understand that a more disciplined approach will probably serve them well and uh, develop a much better return on their efforts. So going back a little bit, You mentioned you had a circle of friends of real estate agents. Like, how did this friendship or how did this get into the real estate versus a different type of field? So, actually, uh, I spend probably about 30 or 40 percent of my time on real estate work. The rest is, you know, I work with companies that are in real estate adjacent spaces. I'm in the commercial real estate space, technology, media, all of that. But, you know, no matter how hard I try to walk away, Real estate keeps drawing me back just because, you know, it's, you know, agents who have a lot of FOMO are always looking for that sort of secret edge. And and so I continue to get calls. And so it draws me back. And uh, I really I kind of have a soft spot for real estate work because, uh, you know, I think there's just so much untapped potential uh, with agents that is not being realized right now. So that's sort of how I would say I kind of fit it into the broader scheme of my career. Well, I will be totally transparent. I am a client of Michael's. Uh, Again, I have been twice. This is my second time around. But I will explain how I connected with him, which I think is interesting. I was, you know, at the gym many years ago on the treadmill. I uh, had my good friend next to me, Trent Heminger, um, who we all know and love with Compass. And I was complaining to him. I said, come on, get on the treadmill next to me. I, I've got all these issues. I got to talk to you about, you know, I think my mom's retiring, but she won't admit it and the dynamics of the team. And isn't this difficult? And he said, I don't like treadmills and I don't want to talk to you about this. Call <laughs> Michael DeSantis. So thank you, 
Trent. Um, it started the process of, I think the thing about coaching is just you have to be open to it because it's a deep discovery, right? right? So I think whether that is in real estate or other parts, any kind of business, right, you have to be open to what potentially is underneath it. I may have come to him with one issue, but as you go through it, you know, there's other things that come to surface. And so when I first was in the coaching, it was really about, you know, my mom's going to retire and I'm going to build a brand and here are all the things I need to do, which felt like a mountain. And I'm so glad I did it. And it was hard. Um, But now I'm back again. I guess it's been like seven years. And I said to Michael recently, look, I know I'm not perfect and I always want to grow and let's take a look under the hood again. And I would say this time around, I think it's harder because I have something that I've built and now I'm asking someone to pull it apart. Whereas the first time I came to him, I was in a desperate mode of what do I do and how do I build something? Now I've come back to him and I've built something and I've said, well, what do you think of that? And so that's, you know, I think you have to be open and vulnerable and ready for feedback and maybe a few tears along the way. Well, it's always hard to start that diagnostic because, you know, inevitably, you know, agents, you know, it's hard not to take it personally. But, you know, as I tell everybody, I'm in this because I want to represent you and I want to get you to a different place. And, and so as long as you're willing to go on that journey, and it's very hard work. And I always tell people, if you're not willing to put in the work, you shouldn't do it. You shouldn't spend the money because the journey and the level of effort will have a corresponding impact to what you really get out of it. And so, you know, Lauren was the ideal student. She rolled her sleeves up. She did it. It probably was going faster than you wanted to, but I think your mom was uh, sort of pretty adamant. She was ready to go. And so you had no choice but to sort of move forward, dive in, and do the work. Mm -hmm. Yes. And this time around, it's a little different because, like I said, it's established. So I guess one of the questions we have is what do you think makes an agent successful? Maybe that's in the coaching process or something that you've sure. observed over time? What, what What's a sort of a trait that you see that sort of bleeds through success? And then maybe on the flip side, what is something that is a trait that sort of causes them not to be able to uh, to grow or to do better? So it's a common theme. You know, I, I, I probably sound like a broken record as I say it to everybody, which is grit, hustle, grind. You know, just putting in the work spending a lot of time. And those agents who are sometimes not successful are just not putting in enough effort and work. And, you know, maybe in a better market, you can, you know, sort of leverage more of your time and your effort and use other team members. But in any kind of market that has an element of difficulty in it, it's just time and effort and grind and hustle. And it's much about striking a balance between working in your business as well as working on your business. Most agents do a pretty good job working in their business, always room for improvement, process, et cetera. Very few agents take the time to work on their business to reflect, how's my business working? Am I in the right relationship? Maybe it's with a partner or other team members, other agents. Do I have the right back office? Am I thinking about goals in the right way? Where do I want to be in five years? It's that sort of reflection that agents oftentimes don't have the time to, but it has the highest ROI on their invested time. And so I'm always encouraging people to sort of put to the side the business that you're doing right now and let's dream and think bigger. That always has the best result. Um, And in terms of those agents that, that can't get there, it's sort of sometimes they're in their own way. mm -hmm. And, you know... My job is, I always tell people, I can't want this more than you. And once they come to that realization that they've got to own it, they've got to want it, then we can have a breakthrough. But until then, it's it's not a productive exercise. So, so Lauren, a question for you. Understanding the reason, number one, you went to meet with Michael. Reason number two, when you guys met seven years later, like what was the driving factor to have a coach the second go around? I mean, if I you would... want to share. I would say it's just, you know, growing pains in a sense, not really pains, but like doing something for an extended period of time the same way and sort of plateauing. What could I do better? What can I fix? 
what maybe do I need to go back to the basics on? Like he says, working on your business. Some of that part is a little digging self-discovery, and that's some of the painful part of it, is have I been working on it? I think when he describes working in and working on, working in is, hey, Lauren, can I go see this house today? Absolutely. Let's do it. That's what we all love, I think. I mean, most people that do this business. Um, Hey, Lauren, can you meet with me on Friday at 3? I want to talk about listing my house. Absolutely. That's like showtime. I am ready. Working on is very different. That's how does the dynamic of the team work? Is everyone pulling their weight? Am I getting the most out of everybody? Because I think most agents would say, well, maybe not, but I know me. I would so much rather just sell houses. I didn't get into the business to manage people, but I understand that managing people and having a harmonious environment and getting the most productivity out of everyone will allow me to do more of being in front of my client and doing what I like. It's just I feel that I, I... I wouldn't be doing a service to myself not to look under the hood every few years. And that it's it's hard because it does bring up a lot of things that you don't necessarily do. Are, if, are you willing to be like a little bit more open book with this conversation just for a second? Yeah. OK. So better her than me. Right. Yeah. Well, well, I mean, as a case study, I, I su- yeah. suppose. But so it's been you said seven years since mm-hmm. she originally came to you. Mm-hmm. Um I'm also interested in like, you know, she comes to you, she's like been under uh, the wing of her mother and her mother's very well established business. Mm -hmm. And then she comes to you to help uh, set something up. What did what did that look like to you? I mean, uh, I mean, Lauren's a very capable person. She's been watching someone do real estate at a very high level for a long time. Why not just continue what she's doing? What 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 was she nervous about? What what was the coaching aspect? Well, I think that Lauren was sort of a great solo contributor agent. I don't want to speak for you, but we really had to sort of go back to basics to understand how she was going to run a business. And um, you know, I, I think you know Sherry wouldn't even mind me saying this is that she told me when she started when we started together, which is I think the business could be run better. And I'm going to step away because my time is, is, is over in, in real estate. But this is the moment for Lauren to now decide how she's going to run a business in a way that will create sustainability for the long term. So it was you know, sort of looking at everything from the marketing approach to business planning, to the team, to the resources, how much she was going to invest in marketing, all of those sort of you know, basic questions that, you know, Lauren had to develop her own uh, positions on. I think that was a real crossroads, too, because my mom was super successful and was in the business for 40 years. I could have stayed as the Davis team. No one needed to send her off necessarily. But what I find is that this job crosses personal lines. This job, I'm embedded in the community. I'm with my family. I'm seeing clients. I'm walking away from my family on a weekend. I'm missing games. I'm doing things to be in my business. And they feel so intertwined to me. And I think I had to feel that what I was stepping out for was super genuine to who I was. And that I wasn't, I didn't have like a front. So the front would have been the Davis team in my mind. And so when I had Michael come in, it was like, no, it should be the Lauren Davis team. It should be a new logo. It should be a new web- website. It should be all these things that can prove that I can do this on my own two feet. So that's really what it was. And that was hiring an assistant, You know, doing everything, starting with social media, all the basics of the business. I really built a business. Obviously, I had you know, 15 years of amazing tutelage and amazing mentorship. You know, for all the great things that my mom was in the business, she wasn't a great manager and and she didn't want to be, nor do I want to be. But I also know that in this day and age, I sort of have to be. Right. It's very different now. Yeah. And so I think I struggle with as time goes on. Well, is that I had I looked at it as a family business. And when I hired my first hire, to me, we were so intertwined that to me, that is my family. And I feel that everyone who works for me and us as a team, that is my family. And like I literally could start crying. But it it just we're there for each other. And maybe that inner being so intertwined is a plus because I have the loyalty. But I think the negative is, am I able to get everything out of these people? And am I giving them the autonomy to be their best selves? 
and for every single person in this small unit to function. And I think that's why I came back to Michael is to say, what do you see? Because I can't see it anymore. I see this as completely intertwined. And so I feel like now I have someone who's coming at it from a business perspective and saying, hey, you guys need to do X, Y, Z. And that, and so, yes, it feels super personal, but I think this will be in a tremendous growth period because I'm willing to look under there. Mm -hmm. And it's not all pretty, but right. the changes will benefit us going forward, I do believe. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and honestly, a lot of Asians over time, particularly successful ones, they sort of settle in and, you know, they have a way of doing things and it doesn't vary. And, you know, oftentimes I'll go in there and suggest different ways of doing things, creating more accountability with the team, which all sound good, but then we have to get sort of into practice or execution, which is very hard because, you know, these small teams with when you're with uh, each other every day, it is a family. And I sort of have to go and sort of be that catalyst to say, it's good, but we can be better. Mm -hmm. And but it forces conversations that are oftentimes very difficult. And it's not and Lauren's an example of a you know sort of an individual agent running a team. But you know, I oftentimes get into situations where I'm working with, you know, partners. And, you know, by the on the outside, everything's going great. And they tell me everything's good. And then I sort of interview each of them. And I talk to them about what is and isn't going good. And soon, you know, the uh, the cover has been blown. And, you know, sort of that work of bringing two partners back together or not is really, you know, kind of some of the harder work that I have to do. I mean, uh, you know, I think one of you asked me, you know, so what's the hardest thing you have to do? It's sort of telling two partners that although they've been extremely successful, that maybe the time has come to go into different directions. Very difficult conversations that I need to have. But it's almost for the better for both of them. So those are the kind of things that sometimes can be challenging about being that sort of outside catalyst advisor, telling people that they probably know deep down but really don't want to hear. Right. So what makes a successful partnership? I mean, that's my setup is different. But, you know, is it in general, is it like, someone's the alpha person and someone's more or someone's more of the face and someone's more of the admin like what makes a successful right. partnership so and and i when i say partnership i i mean sometimes two and oftentimes three partners right. that work together and what i've noticed is the common trait is they each have a lane which they occupy they each have very discrete responsibilities and the sum of all of it equals a really well-oiled machine they're respectful of one another they uh defer to one another when needed, but they each hold the other accountable. That's what makes a great mm. partnership. Partnerships where they're sort of working in parallel with one another don't oftentimes uh, work over the long term because the kind of hard conversations that need to be had on a regular basis probably aren't happening. So that would be sort of uh, kind of one big takeaway that I have in terms of, uh, you know, working with partners. You know, and, and, and honestly, sometimes I people come to me as a partnership and say, we don't think it's working exceptionally well. And after I dig in a little bit, it actually is. And it's more just a slight tinker as opposed to a complete dissolution of the partnership. Mm -hmm. Every situation is completely different mm -hmm. that I, that I, that I Absolutely. go after. And, uh, you know, the art of it is it's like a big giant puzzle, which is why I love it so much because, you know, I'm sort of one of these people that challenges myself more than anyone will ever challenge me. So being presented with a new set of facts and a new real estate team and trying to dissect it and analyze it and get to the bottom of it, it just it just brings me so much and you joy. don't have to worry about the high interest rates. You just have to come in and... <laughs> That's, and I don't know, that's exactly right. Exactly. Yeah. It that's makes it. me want Michael's job. Watch out. I know, right? Let's go do this. It's like we can just go dissect these teams and we don't have to worry this. about the rest of right. I know I don't that's have right. to do it. I know just enough to be dangerous. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and in full disclosure, uh, I think that because of Lauren, we have hired Michael on our team, for me personally, and uh, it's eye-opening. Like We did it just because we've been going the same course for you know the better part of a decade, Rob and myself. And I'm like, well, let's look under the hood, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. And uh, it is scary. It's frightening, but I'm also welping, welcoming the opportunity to tweak what we have going forward. And uh, it's eye-opening. I think right now I'm going through, it's like 42 pages of expenses 
from last year. And he's like, we've got to cut X, Y, and Z. Get your number down from X down to Y on this set of numbers. And on this other set of numbers, we got to get it down from X to Y. So I've literally got 42 pages of uh, expenses just going through highlighting like red, yellow, red, yellow. Well, those are the numbers. Wait That's just the numbers. The, yeah, exactly. Wait till we get to the emotions, right honey. This You just buckle up. Yeah. This is – but this – have you all ever been coached before? Have you ever? We have not been coached. Not okay. like this, like going okay. in deep with the numbers. And I think we're pretty successful. I mean, we do a, a yes, really good book are. of business and yes. have done well. He described the group as we are the Titanic. We have hit the iceberg. We are going to steer the <laughs> ship somewhere else so that you guys can all be saved. And I'm like, wow. But I, tear the, I tell this to their group and they're like, wow. But we need somebody like that. We don't want to be told, you guys are great. Keep doing what you're doing. You're going to get better. You're going to do more. It's like, no, I need somebody to like, Fine tune the the nuts and right. bolts of their group so that we can really grow so to the next level. So did he tell you no more sweets for the Nats games mm-hmm. and no more floor tickets? We're not there yet. We're not okay, there we yet. haven't gotten to yeah. that. Okay. <laughs> that's Friday. <laughs> <laughs> but that's your personal thing. That's not a t- anyway. Well, I, we don't need. I did mark that on the list. Yeah, Hello? it's true. It's Hello? true. Obviously, why would why else would you do it? Right? <laughs> you will not find a single client who will tell you that I will play grab ass with them. I will not. <laughs> it's tough. It's difficult. It's yeah, exhaustive. Yeah. And um, yeah, I don't. I don't tell you what you want to hear. There's ne- it, that never happens. Well, that's the your, your job is the opposite of that's that. right. Literally. Exactly. Um, Have you ever gone into an appointment where you're just everything is positive? Can you imagine? No, no, no. no. You always <laughs> find something. No. No way. We're humans. Right. It's yes. not possible. Everybody has room for improvement. Yeah. Yes. It's just degrees or the areas that they can improve on. Do you ever get pushback from the oh, agents? Yes. Like All the time. Oh, All yes. All the time. But, you know, the more that people push back on me uh, and consistently push back, my theory on that is, is they're not ready. Mm-hmm. And that's okay, actually. You know, in fact, I've actually terminated or uh, paused relationships until actually clients were ready because it's not a great use of my time and it's not a good use of their investment dollars to sort of not be willing to go on the journey. I think that is so true. You have to be ready to take the feedback and move through it. So he came to us with a list of laundry list of things that we can be doing better. And that feels overwhelming, right? And, And we, you know, we prepare for Uh, meetings with Michael as if we're going to present our thesis at Harvard. Is that an accurate? Yeah, you're definitely getting the most out of it. And so we really prepare. So we were preparing for our last meeting and um, we, the four of us spoke together and there was really only one thing we were like, I don't know if that's necessary, but there might have been 20 others that we really felt like, okay, we can move forward on that. We can improve on that. And the funny thing, and, and Michael loves this, is um, the thing that we're really kind of pushing back on is super simple, which is like, I'm just not so sure that LinkedIn is going to take my business to the next level. He loves LinkedIn. He's obsessed with LinkedIn. So we just, you know, that's just something that's like, I don't know if that feels like me. Is it really going to do something? And everyone professes to be an expert there. And uh, so it's, you know, I'm not saying I don't want to look at myself and make changes. I'm saying, Maybe, but I, I've gotten a little better on LinkedIn. But the joke is, when I first started in the, the you know, with working with Michael seven years ago, like, oh, build up your LinkedIn. You got to make all these connections. Da, da. I said, fine. I so we started doing that, and I got asked out on two dates, and I was like, this is not <laughs> not what you were thinking. This is not. This is a business platform. I'm like, Michael, I think I'm out on LinkedIn. But it was just funny because no one, you know, that's not what it's for. I've I've <laughs> but, constantly you know, wonder about LinkedIn myself. That's so that's I mean, it was just one. you know, my business profile was so appealing that it's just obviously couldn't, they couldn't help themselves. Couldn't help themselves. It was multidimensional. It mm-hmm. was. And you yes. obviously did not know the two people because they would know you're married. Uh, well, would that matter? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> one I did not know, and one was a recycling program. So yes. Okay. Okay. <laughs> ah. Okay. Um. So you worked with uh, obviously you worked you worked with Lauren you worked with Brent you worked with successful agents probably many many more. What's a give us some common traits among the most successful agents that you have worked with? Um, the most common traits that I would say is hustle, high intuition and emotional intelligence, and really a passion for getting the job done, not being afraid of the work. Um, those are probably the common traits I can tell, and I can usually tell in like a half hour from meeting somebody if they've got sort of those innate high performing qualities that I sort of like to see. 
it, it doesn't take long. Is it a personality trait, though, too? Like, are people extroverts, introverts? Are they, do you, what are you vibing off of them? What do you, what do you, are there actual personality so, traits? So what I would say is I don't think it's introvert versus extrovert. Like, I ask people at the beginning of a session to sort of, you know, kind of tell me a little bit about their journey and how they answer the question and where they talk not only about their successes, but really where their pain points are. It's less performative and it's more vulnerable and open. And that vulnerability is the key to sort of unlocking the value that's not there right at the moment. So I can tell usually at that point. You use the term hustle a couple of times. How do you define hustle? What is that feeling? So hustle is defined to me as somebody, one of my biggest kryptonites is people need to get up early. They need to be up at 5 or 5.30. Brent they, got an A they, plus they need in to that be, category. You know, whether they go to the gym, but they're hitting, they're hitting email fast, they're thinking, they're reflecting. And not only are they working on issues right for that day for real estate, they spend that time early really reflecting on their business. Big picture. Where do I need to be going? Where do I need to be taking this? Not resting on their laurels. And so I, I think that getting up early – chasing the day, working really hard in and on. Even if you collapse at eight at night, it's more about grabbing that morning. Yeah. What about the flip side of that? Are there common traits that you see from agents that are on the opposite of like successful, that they're just bad traits, bad habits? I, I think it's sort of like not working enough hours, justifying, not following up or um, – engaging their referral sources and their key clients on a consistent and regular basis and creating the kind of authentic relationships that are critical to sort of growing a business. If you always have an excuse why you can't, you know, engage with someone that's important to your business career, that to me is a big red flashing sign that uh, you're probably not maximizing your potential. Um. One thing that I was thinking about when we were preparing for this was, um, like, uh, I think we've all experienced a sensation of burnout in certain, in some respects. Uh, if you've done this business long enough, um, it doesn't. You don't feel that when the market's going really well and like there, you're getting call after call and big check after big check. But then, like, when you're you're continuing to work really hard on on your business and things aren't connecting because of whatever external sources. Right. So my thought was. Um, and, and, you know, we're always getting uh, new stuff thrown at us, too. New technology, a new platform, news sources, everything else. It's happening very quickly and more and exponentially more all the time. Where do you coach in, like, the balance for these kinds of things? We, you want to get us back on track or get someone, like, some new ideas for their business. But we, there may already be, like, a level of, like, burnout. We can't get back to that homeostasis. What do you think about all that? So, uh, so burnout is a very common trait, particularly in a down market. And, you know, I sort of see that a lot. And depending on where the agent is in their career, you know, sometimes burnout is a sign that it's time to sort of do something different. And what I really try and encourage agents at that level of burnout who are a little bit later in their career it's more about, well, think about what the future could look like. And it's not so much about leaving real estate. It's about, well, what's your platform going to be after that? How are you going to sort of make an impact in the world? And the more that people, you know, particularly more senior agents, can create definition around that, the more that maybe they've got a pathway out of this. Sometimes burnout, though, is really just a reflection of a market. Like in the last year, there's been a lot of sort of examples of burnout I've seen. And what I've really tried to get, you know, those type of agents to do is to focus on some of the broader ways in which they can create more clever branding opportunities, more interesting direct mail pieces, how they can sort of talk a little bit more creatively about their business. You know, and I'm also a really big fan of the fact that I think that 90 percent of realtors mail it in on newsletters. This woman to my left is the gold standard, but she's sure. not doing anything that's necessarily proprietary. She's just talking from the heart. And that's the kind of thing that so many agents leave on the table. They take the sort of the template that they get from the brokerage. It's fine, but there's no central message. There's no letting clients in on who you are. How are you wired? Why would I give the mo one of the most important decisions and place it in your hands. I, I really believe that sort of this real estate transaction, it's not a transaction, 
It's a trust pact. And using a newsletter to create more and more of a bond with the very people that you want to go on a journey with is such a huge opportunity, but it's still very underutilized. Okay, well, that's a, that's a great piece right there as you're talking about something that's really effective in your eyes. And Lauren, we've talked about this before when you've been here. Tell us, but let's revisit that a little bit. So doing the, the newsletter. newsletter. Yeah, tell so us a little about that. When I first hired Michael back, you know, seven years ago, it was a laundry list of things to do. Um, it was, you know, get a website, do all the, I mean, it, it was a big list. And then it was like the cherry on top was you're going to do a newsletter. And I, I mean, I spoke about it earlier. It's like, again, if I'm leaving my family and I'm going to work every day and I'm not present for everything, like everything has to feel genuine to me. The, t the things that I put time and energy <clears throat> into, I want to be a reflection of myself. So he says, do the newsletter. And I said, like, well, I don't really, it, 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 my experience with newsletters in the past had been sort of this canned, templated feel. Something and you I delete like, immediately. It doesn't feel right to me. So mm -hmm. We looked at some examples and tried to get more of a what does it look like to us visually? What does it sound like? What is what does that mean? And and this is an example of a branding thing. But you know, you all probably do not receive this, but the Goop newsletter. You know, I'm like I used to love to hate Gwyneth, but you know, she obviously has put together a beautiful brand, and you cannot deny it. And she does actually two news newsletters a week. And I'm doing one like once every six weeks. But the point is, is she does do a letter and she does have this and, and it's beautifully curated. So it's like that's a goal, right? Something that's pretty, something that's spoken in my voice. And so the way that I approached it is every time we do a newsletter, there's generally a theme. And today one came out. So or, or it came out at 10. And so I'll give you an example. This month is January, and it's the start of a new year. And so I always have to – it starts with a letter that I write, and then that creates the theme. So I think to myself, well, what's genuine to me? And I read this book over holiday break, and it was impactful to me. I'm like, oh, a new year is like a new book, a new opportunity, a new chapter. You will open the book. You don't know what's going to happen. You don't know where it's headed, but you're willing to go on that journey. And you're willing to know that there might be some twists and turns in here and there, but it's it's a new opportunity. And that's that was basically, we are in a new chapter. And so that's the theme of it. And with that, um, the it, it goes back to a poem um, that was written by a woman named Maggie Smith. And She's the author of this book, but she became famous for writing a poem called Good Bones. And it has a dig in the poem about real estate agents, and I tie that into the newsletter. So it always does have a business tie back. But the funny thing about this um, this poem is she talks about how realtors say, you know, when they're showing a quote-unquote shithole, she says, that realtors say – you could make this place beautiful. So it's it's so that's the name of the book. But she became famous because she wrote this poem. So then the theme bleeds through. We're heavy on a theme. And so the theme is good bones. So then we always do a house crush. And so we picked a house in New Canaan, um, I guess is it New York, Connecticut. Mm -hmm. And um and the house had good bones. And then we make book, book recommendations. And then we, so we all, it, it becomes a theme. And it's usually a personal side. And then it ties back to the business. And I will tell you, the newsletter works to communicate with my peers. It works to communicate with my clients. It works to communicate with my sphere. And it is the number one thing that I'm walking down the street that someone stops me for. And I mentioned earlier, I went on a listing appointment in a neighborhood I grew up in where I spend a lot of time, um, you know, working to get the clients. And these people had been receiving my newsletter for seven years. I had never met them. And when I um, met them in person, they said, oh, my gosh, we love getting your newsletter. And, like, we like you even more in person, meaning they thought they knew me. And they right. thought that they had a real good sense of who I was, you know, based on that. So it's like I'm massaging and messaging to my clients, to my building my peer reputation. It is – but it's a labor of love. I've never put a letter out there that didn't have a personal tie back to me, you, you know? Do you ever feel like you, you're unable to, get, to put that out? Something? Yeah, because – no, I mean, I, I think today I'm thinking, you know, uh, we're going to do one in February and I think I'm going to name it like put me in coach and then tie back to coaching and, you know, attach the podcast. And this also – I'll just walk you through how my brain works with this stuff is 
then that's also right before um, like my March team, Madness. we all have our um, our kids all play sports and they all play lacrosse. And so t- um, team tryouts are in February. This is a, so put me in coach. Like, are our kids coachable? Like, what is a coach looking for? You know, wh- am I coachable? And, you know, I, hey, clients, I'm always looking to improve myself. I'm always looking to get better. And that's what we do for you. So just something along those lines. That's good. Yeah. yeah. Two that. questions on that. Sure. How long does it take? Like, how much time invested in each of your newsletters? So now it's running pretty smoothly in the sense that I'm responsible for writing the opening letter. So I write a draft of the letter. My husband is my editor. So he edits the letter. And then the letter goes to Karina, who handles our marketing. And then her and I talk through the theme. So she knows it's next chapter. And from there, it's done. Because they so this month's newsletter is um, a picture of me in a, um, reading a book in a library. Um, and then it's um, we also usually include a happy client because again that's that's a way for us to to show that you know our clients like us and we picked a client that was having a new chapter she just got married she bought her first house so we tie it back into the theme so it's just thematic it's beautiful in my opinion I don't look great reading a book in the library but the point is is that it's just a consistent message and it comes across I think genuine because People come to us. Sorry, what was your second question? Second question. question, How did the person that you have not met get on your newsletter? Mm. Was that a secret? It's a secret. Okay. (laughs) Especially since you're trying to move into my neighborhood, Brent. I'm just curious, like, if you have, like, a a letter you're sending out that says, if you want to subscribe to my newsletter. Um, That would be the appropriate way to do it this day and age. This is a list that we've had at the Davis team for a long time. It it was predated. So they were already on the mailing list. um, We had the data. And so we were able for our farm many years ago to have data that nowadays you wouldn't have because of like do not call. We do not sell our data. No, no. Brent, you no. can get the data. You want to send a really? newsletter no. to the same person. And, and, and now, for play. We, yeah. it, it, now what happens is um, anyone that's emailing us or we're communicating with is automatically put into the newsletter. So let's just say I went on an interview. Sure. Even if I didn't get it, they're getting oh, my yeah. newsletter. And they're like, you should have picked me. Who's because, putting like, that email address into your newsletter? It's, time, it's pulling it from to the CRM. Okay. Yeah. So it's, it's work. It's not... Now it's more of a well-oiled machine, but I always joked I feel like I'm giving birth every time the newsletter goes out. And I'm actually having a little anxiety because it's now 1045 and it went out at 10. So like, whoa, what happened? You know, because when I get off and I go look at my phone, I will have text messages, emails, phone calls, you know, because right. like they, they engage. But Lauren, for those that might feel discouraged by how on top of things you sound, let's oh go back to seven years Here we and go. talk yes. about how painful. Let's get dirty. Let's talk about how painful that was at the beginning and how yes. difficult of a process that was for you to get your arms around being that vulnerable. Well, sure. But at that time, also, the beauty of it was I had someone young who I had brought in um, to be, it was myself and one other person, Sh- high energy like bulldog, you know, no problem was too big. Someone who just was sort of um, it, it just eyes wide open with excitement. So it was like nothing felt insurmountable at that time. It felt like the two of us could solve the problems. Um, it was – it's intimidating, but her energy to problem solve at that point in time – was huge. I couldn't have done that alone. But it was like, oh, we need a logo? Oh, this is pretty. Like, it's just having someone with a lot of of ideas who you're also aligned with at that point in time. But yeah, absolutely. I mean, it used to feel like a huge deal to put a newsletter out. It still does. It's not huge, but it, it, it's, you know, all these things that you do. It, it there, It's not easy. And I'm, oh, I I, I'm not trying to paint that picture. And and I will say, you know, coaching, whether it's Michael or anyone, it's not easy. No, no one's professing this is easy. It's saying I'm willing to look at what's working and what's not working and what could be done better and maybe things that I don't need to be doing. It it that's what you're willing to to, you know, hear. And and you can decide what you want to take forward or not. Right. So I, mean, yeah. I guess a question for Michael. This, the coaching, whether seven years ago, we're going through it now. Can you kind of walk us through the structure? Are you meeting sure. with the people weekly, biweekly, monthly? So, you know, usually my typical engagement with a real estate, either a single agent or a team, is 
Uh, probably around six months. I usually like to say that six-month engagement is really about the minimum amount of time it takes to really sort of do a diagnostic on really everything to create a plan of changes that you want to implement and then to really, you know, put them in action and then course correct as needed. And, you know, and sort of my approach with uh, any new client, whether it's in real estate or not, is, is to review the finances, to review the composition of the team, the resources that uh, are, are being used uh, or not used. Uh, I, took a, I take a pretty strong look at like sort of where you're selling, where you're not selling, kind of the profile of the clients. Uh, we look at branding and marketing and where there are opportunities to improve, whether it's from a digital standpoint, newsletter, uh, direct mail. Um, we also look at like sort of where agents are and are not giving back to the community and how they're participating in the world, how they're, uh, you know, sort of engaging with their neighborhoods and their communities. And so it's sort of like a, a it's a little bit of a playbook. But it's probably customized to some degree based on who I'm working with. But usually over this, the period of the six months, we're meeting, you know, I, I, I usually say two to three times a month. It ends up always being more. I'm texting much more continually than I'm being texted to. Where are we? Are you on top of it? <laughs> I am a master nudge. And that sort of constant on top of the client creates an expectation that they, I hope they can create on their own when I'm away and I'm gone, being accountable. And I always tell, um, you know, every agent or team, when I'm not gone, make sure you've got the right person to hold you accountable, whether it's a team member, a spouse, uh, a significant other, somebody in your business community or your circle. Accountability is the one thing that both can really work well for an agent or team or can be sort of an Achilles heel if you don't have the right person holding you accountable. Mm -hmm. What um, you've given us like a lot of different pieces of the puzzle here for what people are are in need of and, and what you give them. But like for our listeners who might be listening to this, what would be like some of the top items that really make someone like feel it in the pit of their stomach when you have to like lay it out there for them? Like what is, what is, what is a common theme that you might see with, with realtors where they're like, they're definitely they need, to, they need major help in this department or that department. Right. And it's usually around two common themes, which is A, not spending enough time in their business mm -hmm. and not getting the result they want, and B, being in an environment where there's one or more underperforming resources within the team that need to dramatically change as almost a kickstart to get to the next level. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the amount of... Uh, tolerance that agents have with uh, people particularly that are not performing well is astonishing to me. But I understand it's a small business. It's a small group of people, great relationships with one another, but it's kind of forcing conversations that otherwise probably wouldn't happen that are, that are both the opportunity and the difficulty. Well, I mean, that's the thing. It's not a corporate structure. Right. There is no HR. We always laugh, like, when something absurd happens in our little foursome at the office, like, who's in charge of HR today? Because we are truly entrepreneurs, and I think Michael is trying to apply business practices and principles to this business to make it m make those decisions a little bit easier. And I think that's one of the things that we can benefit from is looking at it as a business and we're running a business and this is how a business should run as opposed to, you know, that I think I would also ask or say that that's probably another reason that some agents aren't successful is because when they do have downtime, they don't put the, the time back into the business or when they do have downtime, they're like, you know, skiing or, you know, sunning somewhere because they you know, don't have anything to do. But it's like building in the hard times is what's going to help you going forward. Um, I will I'll give this little story about Michael. Years, I guess it was 2019, I did not have a great year. And I really could not put my finger on it. And it was frustrating for me. And we weren't working together anymore. And I had had good years. And just 2019 was just a hard year for me. 
And I called Michael and I was like, I don't know. I just, I don't know. Like, I, this is really hard. And he said, um, okay, well, tell me a little bit more about that. And it's like, well, I didn't get this listing and I this happened and that happened. And and he said, I thought it was like a really good question. And it's a basic question that makes you think. It's like, are you being considered for the opportunities that you want to be considered for? Meaning, am I getting the listing calls that I want? Are buyers reaching out to me that I want? And I said, yeah, I actually am. I'm getting the calls. Like, I don't feel like I'm missing out on the huge opportunities. It doesn't seem like I'm being beaten in my marketplace. And he's like, it's just a series of bad luck. You're still the same person that you always were. And it's like, you know what? I can look back at that in harder times. And now I can ask myself that question. Hey, am I getting the phone calls that I want to be getting? Like in your business, Brent, are the developers you want to be doing business with, are they still calling you when they're getting a new project? Because if they're not, then something went wrong and something's wrong, you know, at the base of your business. But if you're still getting those calls and the year's still tough and the units aren't selling or whatever it is, there could be other factors. I can't point to a specific factor that year other than a series of bad, you know, uh, uh, events, uh, bad luck. We've had that. Yeah. And it's like it just was such a relief to have that conversation with someone who knows me well and who could simply ask, are you being considered for the business you want to be considered for? And you go, well, yeah. Then you know you're still doing the right thing and you're still putting the energy and the time back into the business and you're doing the basic foundation because that's what will that's what will save you. Yeah. So well, and also many many agents take that very personally, mm-hmm. and they think it's somehow a reflection of where they're not hitting the mark or not presenting in the way they always have. And it's sort of like I always encourage people go back to basics. If you're still being the same person you have, if you're still you know being called to the table, mostly when uh, people have needs, then just stick to your name. It all generally works out in the end. The ebbs and flows of the of the business are just a uh, an inevitability. It's an extremely competitive business, and we we play in a small pool, um, generally speaking. I mean, look at the inventory right now, for example. I mean, there's like so few houses on the market. So any listing call, if you're if you're getting the, the call, like think of how rare the call is right now. You're so psyched. But it's it's funny. Um, this is a little off topic, but I, I think it was in the full fee agent book that talks about like the favored and the fool. You have to look out for all those kinds of things too when you're out there. You should, yeah. You know, I think you still go back to the basics. Like, I think it's tempting in this market to be like jumping up and down anytime somebody calls you. But are they just looking for information and yeah. they are going to pick their, you know friend who sold one house last year. I mean, you still need to evaluate the situation and still make good use of your time because like Michael would probably instruct, like that's probably a waste of your time and you could be working on your business. You know, you could still be, I think if you just gave back to your A-list and just worked the contacts that are already bought into you. And that's one of the things that Michael helps. He didn't get down into the nitty gritty is like identifying who your real top contacts are always who refers to you who believes in you who who are the people that are back over and over and over again like that's where you want to put your time and energy and it sounds so basic but sometimes in this world when we get lost when there isn't a lot for sale and it's a really tough time if you just go back to your people and and on that point i always tell people continue to evaluate who's on that list and who isn't because you know over time you meet new people that you know you think about If I invested more time with that person, could they end up on that list? If the answer is yes, then they should go on the list as well as a potential. Because it isn't about who's currently necessarily only the people on that list currently referring to you. But it's also about people who with potential and time and effort could go on that list. So constantly evaluating that I think is a really important point. I like that. Um, yeah, I'm always thinking about like who my cheerleaders are and who my fans are when I'm going, like especially at Christmas time when you're going through that Christmas list, right? And um, but I like that, like nurturing someone to that next level, mm-hmm. and knowing who, who who is really like positive through that experience, and taking really taking care of those people. And also, you know, making hard decisions about people that over time aren't necessarily really needing to be on that list. Mm-hmm. I mean, at some point, you have to make conclusions based on your best efforts that the person really isn't still. Um, needing to be on that list. And then those are hard uh, conversations to have with yourself. But I always like to tell people, if you don't have 25 people on your key referral list, you're not out in the world enough. That's good. Yep. Um, Quick question for you, Max. Have you been coached? 
You've been doing this for 20 plus years. I can't remember. I'm just. <laughs> <kidding. laughs> I can't remember. I don't recall. Um, oh, you would. You put would you recall. On the spot. <laughs> no, I've not. I'm no. We have not done that. Um, oh, no, no, we, Max. You, like, in oh, me curious, no. Like, why have you not had a coach? No, I think the the Everything most close perfect. to coaching I've ever done was like ninja training. Right. Um, and, and I liked all those things and I did them for a little while and I, and some of those things, the, the principles have still stuck with me in the way I do things. Um, yeah, like right now, uh, in my business, I would definitely say that, um, it's a little scattered. There's a lot going on that's outside of like work. That's like driving me a little bit insane. That's taking me away from it. But I, I find I'm finding myself like kind of rotating back after the new year, like going to the office early and like working on things. And you know what I mean? It's like. It go. It ebbs and flows with me. It's always the way I've been. I don't. I don't. I, I don't put so much pressure on myself at this point. Um, and who's I holding you accountable, Max? Who's holding me accountable? I mean, I work on a team, and so we have. Uh, I work with Jonathan Taylor, and we're. You know, we hold each other accountable in a lot of ways. We have for a long time, and just knowing that he's there, it, it makes me feel accountable. Beyond that, I'm, you know, we're, the rest of the team is, is very supportive and, um, I mean, I don't know, I'm still the main person to me, to, to be honest with you. Like, the, the feedback loop is internal, okay? Harder so. on yourself than anybody else can be hard on Oh my on God, you, right? this is crushing. Good? Yeah. And uh, I've been like that from day one and it's always, there's always some new obsession, that, you know, that I'm dealing with and some new external thing, but... Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, I still completely love my doing my business and everything like that. And I'd say that, you know, the, the last year was after the two previous years was disappointing, still was a great year. And so coming out of that, I definitely need to look at some things and uh, figure out some new techniques or, or rebuild the techniques that I used before that were successful. And I'm kind of in that place right now. Good. So, yeah. What's the average, I guess, career agent that you see? I mean, someone coming right out of real estate license school, would not probably be a candidate, but usually not. I mean, I will meet some of those people as part of a team, uh, but usually the engagement is mid-career or above. Mid okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, rapid fire. You ready? So you may or may not know this about Michael, but he's very involved in the arts. Yes. Theater. Okay, nice. So what <clears throat> is the show that everyone needs to go see in, I guess, New York or Washington. What's the show? So I have a, it's a two part answer. Okay. So the the show, and I'm selfishly promoting the show because I'm one of the producers on it. But Moulin Rouge on Broadway is our show, and it's now touring across the U.S. as well as on Broadway and in London and in Australia. Um, so that's the current show. But uh, the other passion project I've got that we're working on right now is is. Uh, I'm part of the development team working on the stage adaptation of Princess Purple Rain, which just got announced wow. Uh, wow. the other day. Really so exciting. I'm oh, very part of that. Cool. And Let's go, Max. We're hoping to uh, work on that journey and get it to Broadway eventually. Very cool. That's love awesome. That. I love Broadway. Huge fan. I like Michael Jackson. MJ. Michael Jackson has, uh, he's got his coming to the Kennedy Center. It's coming to the Kennedy Center. It's been on New York for a while. It's done very well. Moulin Rouge. I saw that up in New York. It was very good. Yeah. Very good. You want to so. do one more rapid fire? Well, uh, yeah, time. one more rapid fire. So, what are you currently reading, or what do you recommend? Well, I I, have, I, I never have time to read, but uh, the last book I read was the Sphere book by Prince Harry, only because I, I I was able to then you know sort of develop opinions that I thought about before, but then became a little bit more uh, solidified on. So, you're a, a expert on the royals. Well, quasi. Only from watching The Crown, of course, too. So I'm a <laughs> big expert on that now. Some, some so what is your favorite? Uh, we'll do a couple more questions here. Rapid Five. So we have two. What is your go-to TV show? Um, so I'm pretty much of a streamer. So I move that around based on what's showing. But like right now, there's I, I watched the Golden Globes the other night. And they awarded all kinds of uh, Golden Globes to beef. Beef, yes. Which is it. this road rage uh, show about this, you know, this man and this woman who go enter into a road rage and they're interlocking lives. And it's funny and dark and really great. It's on Hulu. That's the reason I don't watch it because I had to Google. Beef. I got it on Netflix. You had it on Netflix? Yeah. Okay. And then what was the other one? Succession was the one, the big night winner. Yeah. It won a lot of awards. Yep. 
What's the last live concert you've attended? The, the last live concert, it was the best concert I've ever attended, which is Adele at Caesars Palace. Wow. Paid an obscene amount of money for scalper tickets, but it was worth every penny. She was amazing. Oh, We're going in March. Oh, Are you wow. in Vegas? Yes, in Vegas. It's an awesome is concert. Is it at the Sphere thing? No, it's, no. At, no, it's, it's at, at Caesars, Caesar's. Palace. Yeah. You too is at the Sphere. Okay. Um, you going to see them while you're there? They're not there when we're there. I think they stop in February. We're going the end of March. Okay. So we got our seats. We're in the second deck, front row, so the little girl can like peek over and see Adele. Oh, that's cool. So we're looking you forward know, cause to it. Yeah, because she walks the stage. Yes. Inside the audience, right? Yeah, we're looking forward to it. You have a lot of work to do between now and then. I do. That so we have a lot of coaching to do. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so you know, the, you know the ticket value of those uh, tickets. So exactly. Yes, I do. do. Wow. So... That's all the questions I have. All right, Michael DeSantis, thank you so much for coming down and sharing with us today. It's great to be here. Thanks thank for you, coming. Michael. Thanks, thanks for having thanks, me. Thanks, Lauren. Too. All right, thanks, Lauren. Thanks for listening to Keyed In with your hosts, Max and Brent, unlocking the minds of the industry's top real estate professionals. For more information on selling your home, find us online at keyedinpodcast.com. Remember to subscribe to Keyed In on Apple Podcasts or wherever you like to listen to podcasts. Follow us on Instagram at Keyed In Podcast, at Rabin Max, and at Brent E. Jackson. And follow Max on TikTok at Maxwell Rabin underscore properties.